All right, guys. Uh, welcome to Doozer Shop. Uh, sorry, I haven't made a video in a little while. It must be at least two weeks. Um, you know, just been going to work, coming home, uh, crashing in the evenings. Haven't been motivated to come out in the shop too much. Um, it's just with the, uh, you know, this uh, virus thing going around. Uh, you know, work's just weird, and uh, I don't go to my local. Uh, restaurants that I usually go to and there's a bar at the corner of the street I used to go every Saturday <clears throat> for music bingo I haven't really been going to see my friends and <clears throat> I don't know I am doing stuff in the shop uh, uh, I can't show you now because it's uh, Thursday evening and uh, uh, the meaning to finish uh, when I built the shop I did most of the tin on the, uh, the fascia on the roof and I, I didn't do the one side uh, so I got the scaffold up, and uh, I got some galvanized uh, sheet metal. I've been I got a gu the gutter break, and I've been bending uh, some stuff up, putting it together, making it look, you know, finished. I'm 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 great for doing 90% and leaving the easy stuff. You know, I'm good for doing the hard stuff, but the easy stuff I just kind of like I'll get to it whenever, and then never never comes. But I don't know. I had a couple good days at work. Uh, Sort of stressful, but uh, I'm out in the shop tonight. I've been working on stuff, but I haven't. You know, you kind of got to get in the mood to do to, to videotaping uh, thing. <clears throat> but I've been working on the Colchester 17-inch lathe. I got a lot of good stuff done. Um, I'll take you guys handheld, and I'll show you what I've been working on. But I'm I'm pretty pleased. Uh, um, with uh, the results, let me just let me just grab the camera and take you over there. Um, the Colchester lathe. Um, the control box is new. Um, let me kind of show you as I walk around here. Um, okay. Um, this is the brake lever, and this is the uh, the drum switch. So let me show you how this works. Finally got everything electrical wise on the run. So this is off. So if you go to the um, the right, that's on. That turns on that switch. That ground the uh, the cam and fixed all the linkage. I'll show you that in a minute. So, off. You got to give it a good tug to the on position, and it, it's as you can see fairly easy going off. And then going to uh, brake is further back. And like I say, on. It's a little bit of a tug to turn it on and off, and push with one finger. Um, so that's cool. Um, it had a red ball on it. Now I have a black ball. And I like the red balls because they're cool. They're neat looking. But I took the the red ball off and I got the black ball because it fits the palm of your hand better. For It's a little bit of a push to go to break. And it just hurt my hand with the smaller red ball um, I think this is like almost two inch. I haven't measured it, but it's like inch and three quarter, two inch. And the, the red ball I think was inch and a quarter or something. So this this fits, this is the same thread, and I like it. Um, so let me show you this. So now this is for the uh, the drum switch. That's the drum switch, and it's very big. We'll get to that in a minute. So, um, kind of see here. So this little ball, or one, I don't know if it, if it's that one or a different one. This is quarter inch, quarter twenty thread on here, and and this I put on as an extension. This is a piece of aluminum. Um, I think it's three eighths hex um, stock, just to extend it. You know, about yay much. 
And you're not supposed to turn the lathe on and off with this. You're supposed to use this. And you can, because even though this is a drum switch, the one of the sets of contacts in the drum switch runs the motor contactor. There's a motor contactor in that box, and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. So the positions, looking at it straight on, are this. So that's off, low, forward. If you're an off and you go this way, low, reverse, okay? Off, low, forward, and I think that's off again, I believe, I, I, I forgot. And that's uh, high forward. So you got high forward, you know, fast speed. Um, so that's high forward, off, low forward, off, low reverse, off, fast reverse. So fast reverse, off, low reverse, off. So normally you'd leave it like there, slow reverse, and then on, off, you know, if you want to break, get that. So you just, so I guess that's why they put such a small ball on there. But, you know, it was a, it was such a dinky short little lever, and I know this is the dominant one and and this is the secondary one, but it just it was kind of hard to, to switch. And I, I don't know if I like the look of this hex stock, but you know, it was threaded in here, and actually this is hollow. This is a quarter inch hollow, and then I had to, uh, maybe you can see, uh, I put two 093 roll pins in there, so there's a, uh, uh, a quarter 20 bolt with the shank in there, the straight shank, and I cut the head off, and then I pinned it. Uh, and that's kind of how that works. But it's nice, it's not, it's not heavy, and, and I, I just like it. I thought of, you know, these kind of got like a, a cattail uh, curvy design. Wouldn't it be nice to, uh, put that on there, and, and I thought, yeah, but the ball just fits the palm of my hand so nice for applying force for the brake. So, I mean, they just screw on the ball handles. You know, maybe I'll change them. I'll see how I like it. Um, that is, I think, inch and a quarter pressing domed sight glass. That's a McMaster car item. I think it's actually a Gitz brand, but I think I got that from McMaster Car. And you get the flat ones or the dome ones in inch and a quarter, and they're pressed in. So I got the inch and a quarter because, you know, it's easier to see. Good God. Awesome. All right. Moving down, I got my cover for the quick change box uh, painted. So I didn't strip all the paint off. I, uh, you can kind of see with the, the gloss some imperfections from the surface. I sanded it down. There was about there were three layers of paint on there in, in like the, uh, the old, old school filler. I didn't want to disturb that. Um, so I just sanded it off down to the, the first layer of paint and got into the filler, just barely touched it. And I brush painted that with Rust Oleum uh, Smoky Gray. And that looks good. And I just got it set on there. Um, the oil fill cap. Let me turn my light on. That lamp. All right, good. And I got another sight glass. You can kind of see. For underneath the levers is, is the hole for that. So that looks pretty good. Uh, I know I didn't paint the headstock. Let me back up. And it's a different shade of gray. You know, whatever. I wish it was flat. It's not flat. It's got a curve to it. Um, and the reason, you know, the reason I w say I, I wish it were flat because then you could put tools on it. It's a shelf, right? Awesome. Awesome. But 
I could still actually put a flat cover on there if I wanted to. But eh, whatever. Um, so here's something I don't know. I might have mentioned it in another video. One of the, the many things that make this lathe cool is the headstock is adjustable. So here's the rear adjuster. There's a front adjuster underneath where the chuck is, the, the spindle in the front. Um, so that's a threaded uh, uh, pucky chuck or something. And these uh, bolts, or you know, uh, hex headed screws, the hex bears on the bed on both sides. So you can use it to tighten and loosen these to shift the headstock. Okay? Now, the headstock. It just sits on the flat of the bed there, and you say, well, but it's locked in the V-way. Uh, no, it's not. You might be able to see, there's like a razor blade's thickness on both sides of that. There's like 25 thousandths, maybe 30 thousandths, on either side of that. So the headstock is not touching the bed. I believe it's resting on the flat surface there, but the V-way is not in con intimate contact with the headstock. So, I don't know, maybe you can see there's one in the front and this is the one in the back. So, even if you got a warped bed or a little bit of wear in your bed, you can aim your spindle. Um, probably a minor nightmare of uh, checking and cross-checking and adjusting and checking, but it's, 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 it's available as an option to aim the headstock, and like I say, not many lathes that I'm aware of uh, have this uh, option to adjust the headstock, so that's kind of cool. Um, let me kind of back up. Forgive my uh, cord here. Let me put that out of the way. Okay, so that's the rear of the headstock. Got the pulley on, got the brake shoes on. I got the lamp stuck in the spindle just because it was a convenient place to stick it. Um, so I got the lamp shining light. Uh, this is kind of where the quick change gears go. That's the output of the headstock for the quick change gears for the threading and the feeds. And you can see that's the input on the, th the threading box for the gears and they're splined and yada da da whatever. But I painted all this Great. Okay. Kind of back up. This uh, butt end of the bed here, um, this was all had four layers of paint on it. And they painted over metal chips over the years and it was, it was very nasty. So I cleaned all this with a needle scaler. I mean, I cleaned it down to the metal uh, the, the bare cast iron with the needle scaler. And actually I cleaned it down to the original red primer. I don't know if it's red lead primer or pink primer or what. And even, you know, I, I didn't get the back side. Um, it's not too bad. I even got inside here. This is kind of the butt end of the bed. Um, and this was all full of schmung. Good Lord, was it full of schmung. And obviously the chip pan, uh, there's no paint on the chip pan. Um, but I hit all this with the needle scale and I cleaned everything down with lacquer thin. I put rags in the bottom of the uh, chip uh, pan, chip tray. And I, I used a brush and everything here, I, w I brushed it all down with lacquer thinner after I was done with the, uh, the needle scaler. And... Um, it was like like this top surface, um, right behind the cover there, like this was full of metal chips and grease, and they painted over it. Like the paint was like over the top of a pile of sixes and nine metal chips. It was freaking ridiculous. Like zero fudges were given, and someone just painted this. So I've got one coat of rust oleum on this. Um, kind of thin, I had thinned it out, I might need another coat. But it's kind of stupid because nobody sees it this area because this is where the quick change gears go and then like the cover against the wall, it, this is number two on it, that's the cover, it's this big 
cast aluminum cover. So no one's going to see it, but you know what? It's clean, and uh, I gave it one coat of paint. Eh, I'll probably give it another, because I'm just a perfectionist that way. But again, I guess in the English tradition, the quick change box for the threading is cast as part of the bed. That's kind of crazy. Um, most every single lathe in the world that I have ever seen, the quick change box bolts to the bed. It's a separate piece. And Colchester thought it was some idea to, to cast it as one piece. That means when you machine it, you got to have a big horizontal boring mill to machine all that shaft hole and that shaft hole and that shaft hole and all the, you know, it's, it's quite the deal to, but maybe they figured it was cheaper, more economical. I don't know, but it sure is different. I got to tell you that. And the cover comes off. Um, you can see there's a gasket and, and the lip of the cover. Here's like a little sliver of the gasket. And I actually, this gasket was a little protruding and I razor blade cut it. But this cover comes off to access the gears. But this quick change casting is one piece with the bed. It's like I said, working on this Brit British uh, English lathe, boy oh boy, it's, it's a little different. Um, let me even back up some more. All right, I got my elbows on the handy lathe. So you can see the control cabinet. Control cabinet in this black flex conduit going down to the reversing switch. And then I got some gray flex conduit that loops around and goes inside the the, uh, the pecker head of the motor. Kinda. So it might look like the bottom uh, flex conduit's a little long because it kind of bulges out, and the top the top looks just right. Um, I added an inch to the top conduit because it looked a little short and that's brand new conduit I the old stuff was just ratty as can be so um, the bottom is the same length as the factory so let me kind of show you um, all right Okay, let me demonstrate what the whole deal is. So, you can see that clamp collar. See it moving around? That's the little lever. So that's, that's running the, uh, um, the drum switch. For that's forward reverse, low high, reverse low, reverse high, forward. Low. So that's that. Now this, that's the main lever with the big ball. That's on off. So that's on, off, on, off. And if you notice in here, there's a cam type of deal. See how the gap opens? It comes out. And when I hit the brakes, nope, <laughs> that was on. Okay, see how that opens up? See how it's open? Close, open. So that's brakes, off, on, off, brakes. So the brake, uh, there's the little cam thing in there, pu pushes this out. Okay, and uh, what it's really doing is this. All right, I've got a totally sketchy camera setup, but let's hope this works. So I got you a shot of my linkage. So th that's in the off position. 
on, off. On, off. And if I go to break, that's break, okay? So you can see here, watch here, break mode, see there's a gap in there? So it forces the linkage straight out that way towards the, uh, the drum switch. And there's a spring, that's the spring, watch the spring. Compress. Okay, so in normal operation, that's off. Run, and that's activating the switch behind everything, which I will show you in a minute. Off and break. So this whole mechanism, this, this is all made out of aluminum bar stock. This piece of bar stock fastens to this one, um, I think it's a 5 uh, bolt screw, and there's a flat surface on here, so that's it. This piece of bar stock is only fastened by that bolt from back behind here. And it was just sticking out, you know, into the wild blue yonder, uh, being supported by nothing. So these two uh, Allen head bolts, uh, bolt on a lever, maybe you, you can kind of see back there the lever and then there's a linkage um, and that's what runs the switch. So I put this block on, so I machined this and bolted it on with another two uh, Allen head cap screws. And there's a hole drilled in here, I believe it's exactly 625, 5 eighths. In there's a um, that um, spring, there's a spring, a washer, and then there's a, uh, you can't see, it's really thin, um, a uh, uh, snap ring. A snap ring's in, in there to hold the washer, which holds the spring, which holds the tension on this iron casting, which <clears throat> rides on that little, there's like a face cam in there, like a detent, almost like an automatic transmission has a detent and that forces it out. Um, so that spring creates pressure on the, the face detent, whether it's going to on or to off, or it raises up even harder to go into brake mode, as you can see. But you see that gap created in there? That gap in there, I think that's like um, 3 sixteenths, uh, 0.200 uh, of an inch. So this, um, reinforcing bracket to reinforce the swing of this not only had to just rotate on the shaft but it moves in a linear um, I guess you call it uh, axial fashion along the axis of the shaft because it creates that gap so it not only turns but it moves in and out is a fancy way to say or a simple way to say what I just said in a fancy way it just made me feel better to put this bracket on here so it pilots the end of this piece swinging out here. Now this is like, I don't, I never measured it, uh, I don't think, but it's like four inches or so, um, maybe three and change, uh, three and seven eighths, but it's not good practice just to have one bolt holding on a piece of uh, bar stock that's just hanging out in the breeze four inches. Bad engineering, um, looking for opportunity to fail. Or if this got loose, it would flop. You know, if this, if this bolt uh, cap screw got loose, this thing wouldn't stick straight 90 degrees out, it would droop. So that's why I made this um, support bracket with the, and I bored that 5 eighths hole with the boring head. So it's like, 625 and a half or 626 or something. Just wanted to show you that, um, just to document what I did there. So on, off, and then keep going past off, and it's break. And the reason it goes out, I think, is to create um, just the detent feel of, of not going on or not being off and ramping into break. It's like a ramp in kind of feel. I guess it's all about the feel of the control. Um, it's user experience, the feel of the levers and the feel of the controls and the, how the detents click in and out. Um, how a car shifts, uh, if it's a manual transmission car, just, 
you know, the feel of your machine means so much in the human interaction. Uh, it kind of drives your brain to say, I really like operating this machine or this machine is just awkward. Um, a lot of guys, they, they've used, uh, there's, a, there's a little blonde lathe that work and no one likes to use it. They just don't like the controls and they can't really tell me why. They say it just the controls feel like they're awkward. And I know a lot of guys, that's why they like a South Bend lathe, because they say the controls feel very natural um, in where they're placed in their hand, you know, near their hands and the, uh, the uh, you know, the, the action, the click in, the click out, you know. This, this lathe has a great action to it, the shift levers, and now part of the reason I did all this is to make, make it sturdy and make it run but the action of the controls is very pleasing to the touch. The click, the, the, the detent of the cam, the spring, and I played with a couple different springs to get the action that I, uh, I, I, I really enjoyed. Uh, you know, it, it, I guess it's the Zen thing, the, the, the feel and the, uh, the sound and the, the whole user experience. So enough about that. Let me take you around and show you the the cam switch and the linkage. All right, I'm, I'm handheld, so I'm not gonna activate the linkage um, right now, but uh, you can kind of see, this is the back side of where I was just previously shooting. And uh, that's the, the, uh, the link that's bolted on the end of this whole regalia. And there's a the, uh, hex head bolt. Um, and as you can kind of see, I needed to make, I got swivel rod ends, and I had to make a Z offset. That's a one inch center to center offset in my linkage. So those are quarter inch, I guess you call them uh, heim joints, uh, aurora ends, or swivel tie rod ends, uh, throttle linkage, whatever. They're quarter 28 uh, thread, and, and I got some quarter 28 bolts in there. You can see uh, I got a spacer made out of aluminum. It's exactly inch and a quarter long. The offset of the Z is exactly one inch. I, I forget how thick the Z is. And then my other aluminum spacer, which is uh, drilled in the center, that's exactly inch and a quarter long. And that's it. So you know, when you, you move the lever on the front, the big lever, that, that's on and off, and, and then brake doesn't do anything really, because uh, the brake activates that control rod. And you can see the pulley and the brake linkage. There's a slot in there, in that clevis. These clevises are cast bronze or cast brass, but that slot um, right there, that's you know, so it can go on and, and off, and then when it actually pulls into that uh, end, that's break. So that slot gives you the freedom of movement of the, uh, the lever. Um, and then, like I said, when it reaches the end, then, then the, the linkage uh, pivots uh, up into the brake drum and releases the brake shoes. Yeah, da da da. So, so this is that Allen Bradley. I think it's a Bulletin 800 switch, and I took off the the roller and I got the linkage uh, heim joint bolted right to it. I drilled three holes. I drilled two holes. The original roller was in that hole. I and I tapped quarter twenty threads um, in the middle, and then I got another hole closer to the pivot. So this allowed me to fine tune the uh, the ratio of the linkage. Um, so, I can't really see. From the center line of that uh, lever bar, you know, the, 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 the actual shaft that the levers are on, from the center line of that to where that bolt is, that's the lever arm distance. Actually, it's a straight line distance from the center of that attaching uh, hex bolt to the center of my rods and everything, right? Um, over, over there. That's 
the, the length of one lever and to get that lever to coincide with this thing turning on and off smoothly um, this had only so much throw and it really it was a little short on throw so I moved the uh, the pivot on the switch in there were never holes uh, in that lever except for just the end one and I forget I think I spaced them three eighths apart or five sixteenths apart I don't remember but the, I kind of I kind of guessed and I, I I put I figured that middle one would be good no I don't remember I thought I figured that one would be good and I drilled the middle one just in case and I'm glad I did because it's it's actually very perfect all right I just wanted to also note uh, to you guys that um, I got my new pulley installed on the motor actually I just slid it down I didn't tighten it down and you know you saw that I got the uh, the uh, brakes installed the brake shoes installed and I got the the keys installed uh, you might remember I made custom uh, keys for the worn out um, wood roof keys that go in that so that's that's all done and taken care of in the brake linkage and uh, like I said I've been painting over there that's why the lamp is over there and uh, I got the uh, the pulley on there the, the, the 5V 550 pulley so once again that's going to bring the RPM up in the maximum um, in the high gear it's going to go from it being a 900 RPM lathe to an 1100 RPM lathe I know it sounds small but it's it, it, it's got the taper lock bushing so I'll never have to uh, worry about that seizing on there I think the motor looks good with the black bells and uh, like I said uh, this is empty well nearly empty I'm waiting to put the uh, control relay in which I could do at any time but uh, oh, let me show you if I can the uh, the conduit, the flex conduit comes in and that's a 90 degree uh, conduit fitting and you can see uh, I have to put tape on them uh, electrical tape to insulate them. I got uh, vinyl caps on them but uh, what the deal is is on these Jiminy Crickets on these big motors there are two uh, crimp eyes and what there is it's a nut and a screw okay wire number four and you put a real short screw and a, a, a bolt I'm sorry a nut and that's kinda how you do it and uh, you know you'd be I have to uh, get my electrical tape but that's how you splice uh, high current uh, whatnots is you tape them you just tape the hell out of them I happen to have these vinyl caps it's easier you know not to be crisscrossing over the top with tape but that's a secure connection now I didn't have any wire markers so what I did is I used white like hospital tape uh, bandage tape you know and uh, I wrote the numbers on the white um, bandage tape medical tape like that's an upside down four and then I used Scott well, well here you go uh, medical tape and scotch tape clear scotch tape so that that works and that's what I did and a good a good pen but yeah that's that's how you splice um, typically motor connections is you, you, you use uh, the ring terminal eyelets and uh, you crimp them on and solder them on and you tape the connections uh, the vinyl caps are just a nice touch that I just happen to have six uh, vinyl caps there's six wires coming out of this motor 
usually they're 9 or 12 wire motors, but this is a 230 volt only motor. So all the uh, delta or star or whatever connections are inside. And uh, basically there's three wires for low speed and three wires for high speed. Uh, it's like two motors wound in one, uh, you know, uh, chassis. So, so that's what I was doing. And uh, you can see that that motor uh, pecker head, that, that was destroyed. And I got it pressed back into shape. And uh, I don't know if I can see. You might not be able to see. So on top you'll see an aluminum. Uh, where the wires come out of the motor, it's an aluminum reinforcing plate made out of quarter inch aluminum. Because there's only two wires that hold that pecker head to the motor uh, housing frame. So I wanted to reinforce that. And you might see the uh, connection in the back. There's the blue insulator and the, the check nut. And I put a washer, a big fat washer, coming in there. And I think that's like inch pipe thread uh, where that check nut is, that lock nut. So I put a big fat washer on there too. And I found a washer and I had to bore it out in the lathe with a boring bar. I threw it in the lathe, hit it with the carbide boring bar thinking I'll just open it up, uh, you know, quarter inch. Hardened washer. That washer was so hard I should have just stopped. I think I ruined a carbide insert. It was so dang hard. But whatever unnecessary to have a hard washer there but it was close to the size I needed and you know how we are uh, in the shop it was like it was made to be right perfect perfect size oh it's hard as can be never seen a washer that hard holy god it was like Rockwell 60C whatever all right so that's that um I got the uh like I said this conduit brand new flex conduit I happen to have a cut off piece from work they're throwing it in the dumpster um, I put the cover on the Allen Bradley switch. There's like 16 terminal connections, but there's like two rows of screws. There's high and low. Actually, I actually called this low because technically it's the bottom. So I had wires like, you know, 13 low and 12 high, depending on what row it was. Um, so that's all good. And if you might remember, there's a reinforcing plate in here um, that these uh, elbows go through. So it's not just the end plate, it's another piece of eighth inch plate steel. And you can't see it, but it's on the inside. I might have showed it in another video. So this is all beautiful, nice and tight. There's six wires in here, which would be three phase low, and there's another three for high, uh, uh, high speed. And then this, uh, wire coming up to the box. There's the three supplied phases and there's two wires for the uh, contact to cut out. And, uh, yeah. So the red are the control wires. And then one, two, three phases. Let me see, I got them like whatever L that is, 9L or something it goes to. Um, but that's how I did it. Um, just beginning to populate this. And three progressively longer wire lengths. How cool is that? Because it's like, you know, one, two, three, or however I got it here. So it's, 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 um, oh, another tip for you guys. I know it's upside down, but these coils, that's a new coil. I got it on eBay for like 10 bucks or 12 bucks. These old coils have screw terminals. Don't break them off. This is on a piece of like fish paper in shellac in resin. Like in, in the coil wire that goes on here is like the thickness of a hair. It's really small. So when you put your wires on here. Use strand wire so it's nice and flexible. Don't ever use solid wire if you can help it. And don't tighten them super tight. Just tighten them snug because you'll break it. It's, it's tape and shellac and varnish. That's all it is that holds this on there. 
So I cracked one of these off on my original coil. And it, Alan Bradley's nice enough, I know it's upside down, so what? They give you a number on it, so I was able to find one on eBay. And I, I cracked it a little, and I just goobered the heck out of it with super glue, and it, it's, it's still good. I didn't break it, um, didn't break the, the wires. But I was able to buy a new one, so I got the original as a spare, which is, is, is okay, because the super glue hardened up and held. Be careful with those. Be careful. Like, here's the handy tool and gauge maker. Um, yeah. That's what happened. Now, I didn't do it. It just kind of shorted out. But these coils and these contactors, these are Arrow Heart um, or H and H. Heart and Heart, or Arrow Heart, depending on the year. These are 230 volts DC. And you can't find them. Oh my God, you can't find them, because I'm missing one here. And look at this. Um, this is solid wire, folks. Um, and that one shorted out. I was using this lathe. It was running. This lathe was running. I wasn't cutting anything. I was just checking out the the variator, but I had power to it and current was flowing. And then poof, the smoke came out and what happened is, I think the screw penetrated into the the windings behind it. And I think I calculated the coil shot. It's something like Six and a half thousand feet of, well, let me think that. <clears throat> it was over a mile long of wire, and I measured the wire with a dial indicator, the drop on a dial indicator, and it's six and a half thousandths diameter wire. Whatever gauge that is, I don't know. But best I could measure, and I was not getting accurate readings with a micrometer, because I think I was crushing it. But with a dial test indicator on the surface plate, the wire in these coils is six and a half thousandths thick, or diameter, I guess you'd say. So I can't find these. Arrow Heart, or H and H, Heart and Heart. Um, I, I, I think I'm going to convert this to VFD. And I thought if I can't get one, so this is forward or this is reverse and this is forward so you can um, just click them up and they work and I thought maybe I could put an air cylinder a little bimba one inch stroke air cylinder on on one of these or both of these I know this is a diversion but you know all this stuff is for the generator and this generator is loud it's it's this is a loud Lathe. I don't like this. It is too loud. I don't like my lathe to sound like a jet airplane taking off. I just don't. So I want to get rid of the generator and the motor. I'm going to keep the original motor. Okay, that's a three horse. I think it's GE or uh, Lewis Alice. It might be Lewis Alice. I forget. But, uh, so the, the actual spindle motor is fine, but it's the, uh, it's the motor generator that is so loud. I think it's a 3600 RPM motor, and why wouldn't you? Because it's a smaller space that it would occupy. So that's the motor, three phase. I think that's three horsepower. Or, no, it's a little more than that. I think this is like five horsepower. So that's the motor, and it's the generator is is part of it. I guess it's considered a dyno motor. And there's that, that transformer. That's not a control transformer. That supplies filament current to the vacuum tube, which is a DC rectifier tube. But this thing is so loud. It sounds like a jet airplane taking off when you're using your lathe. And I just, it's not, 
a pleasurable experience using the Hendy that sounds like a jet airplane. Yeah, the key's in the chuck, but you know what? This thing hasn't had power on it for like years. And it's, that was a new chuck I was fitting, so that's what it is. Um, so anyways, I cleaned up the closing. Milling machine, usually it's full of chips. I mean, I clean this thing twice a week. It's, it's, it's just so much. But uh, let me step back here. Man, it's been a long time coming. Getting that box on. The wiring, oh my God. And I, I mentioned, uh, I think I mentioned, in this wire, it's, um, in this uh, conduit, there's six wires. There used to be eight. As a matter of fact, some are on the floor and I took them out. What they used to do is because this is a two-speed motor and there's two windings, it's a different current draw for low speed and a different current draw for high speed because it's four horsepower slash eight horsepower on high. So these are the heaters and the overloads. So the low speed winding had one set of overloads and the high speed you know, heaters and overloads. The high speed winding had another set of heaters and overloads. So it would come from the motor to the overloads and then back to the motor. And I don't know why. You couldn't just. Oh, because of the switch. So this would go. From the contactor to the switch to the motor back to the switch and I it just so many it was like four extra wires I, it was like four extra wires so what I did is I eliminated the overloads because it it freed up some of the wires in these conduits okay because that's what it was it was an extra couple wires that came out of here and didn't even go into the switch. They just jumped over to here and then they went to the overloads in, in, the, in the box and then the wires came back. To the switch. Or something. There's just a lot of, there's like four or more extra wires for the overloads. So you know what? I eliminated it. And you're going to, you know, people on the internet, the electrical police, they're going to say, well, you're going to burn your lathe up if you don't have the overloads. But listen, I'm using the lathe, you know, right there. I, I'm at the controls. I'm in front of the chuck. I got the phase converter running to generate, you know, my uh, two extra phases making... Three phase, and if I have switched this thing from low to high, and it grunts, I can shut it off. And you know what? Sorry, if you switch from low to high, and I didn't have my phase converter up to capacity, I was only running uh, six horse instead of twelve. If you go low to high, it'll blow the breaker on the phase converter. Uh, the rotary phase converter, not the breaker on the third le uh, generated leg, which is two extra phases. It blows it on the phase converter generating the third leg, uh, which is adding two more phases. So, uh, it's not like you turn this machine on like an, an air compressor or a cooling tower and it's running unattended. You're right there. You can hear the motor. The only one that's going to be using it is me. And if it's making silly sounds, I shut it off because I don't want to cook it. This is never going to be left running unattended. I'm going to always be two feet away, three feet away. Absolutely. So, 
there's just so many dang wires in there. There's so many wires I had to hook up. So there's those six wires are labeled for the motor leads, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then on this side, these six wires are labeled for the the drum switch positions, 12 low, 13 high, 14 high, you know, six low, four high. They're just crazy. And then the input wires is another three and then you know the two red ones for the the, uh, the control circuitry. There is a bunch load of wires in there. And if I could get rid of a few of them, like I say, this lathe is made to be sold to the general public. That's why there's overloads. This lathe is so much better than original. And uh, oh, I, I cleaned the uh, the contacts on this too. Well, I had it apart and blew out the carbon, and everything's nice and in good condition. Um, Still got to get these um, wired up into here. This is where the power comes in. Um, you kind of come to the front. The headstock cover is soon to go on. I don't have a disconnect for this, and I don't know if I need a disconnect or I want a disconnect. Because it really doesn't need it, because it's got that contactor. And there's no lockout tag out, because I'm a one-man shop and this is my house. But... The back of this panel, you know, it, it opens that way, is 12 inches. It's like 12 inches wide, and I think it's like five and a half inches tall. If I could get a 12 inch wide disconnect, you know, I'd lay it sideways, 12 by, call it six, I don't care if it sticks up. But I've got some that are like 13 and a half, and it would stick off both sides, and and I know it, the box is a little hanging off the side of that plate, but still, it just get looking bulky. If I had a 12 inch tall and I could lay it down on its side, contact, you know what, a, uh, disconnect. Maybe I said contact, I meant disconnect. Let me show you. When I say disconnect, I don't have many machines with disconnects. All right, on the SIP, it says uh, Bulldog, okay? And that is a disconnect. Oh, the light comes on. That, my friends, is a disconnect. And it just separates the three phases. And actually, the, the, the start, the, the motor contactor and overloads are down here and, you know the motors over there and it, it's got a reset button there you go what the hell so that's a Westinghouse setup what the hell oh I guess these are the overloads and I'm not sure what that is. But, yeah. So, this is what I got in that box, that big contactor. I, I, I'm looking for one of these. It doesn't have to be a Bulldog brand. But, if it was, you know, 12 inches tall and I could lay it down on its side, that's kind of what I'd like to see. So, I don't know, if anybody knows the one that's, like, you know, there's three, I think those are motor starter switches, that's not really a disconnect. They're disconnects, but they got motor starter heaters in them. A disconnect, like that, is just, they have them as disconnects and they have them with fuses in there. I don't really need fuses. I mean, I could have fuses. It doesn't matter, but... Yeah. So, so that's kind of... Man, that handy's good-looking lathe. It's kind of the story. I've rambled on for too long. It's probably going to be a, an hour video. Whatever. Um, tailstock might be next. I don't know. But got a lot of stuff painted, 
uh, cleaned and painted and got my handles figured out and I, I still need to grind the gap but like I said the control levers are done that was a huge the apron was a huge project I probably have 10 videos on the power feed of that apron and then my uh, threading dials done awesome alright that's it for now do the shop